this is, this is, this is. All right, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to a brand new episode of the podcast. I'm your host, Mike Herrera. This is the Mike Herrera podcast. Um, I take your voicemails if you want to call in, ask questions, uh, do that. We do Music Mondays um, now and again where we play your favorite band or your band uh, and we talk about it. And we just we do that now and again. I have guests on where we talk about, you know, anything they want to talk about, you know, a band, an artist a new album. I love talking songwriting with, with guests. Um, check out my uh, Dave Bazan episode from a while back. It goes real deep into songwriting, but I do that a lot. So any of these episodes you might find very interesting along the way. Uh, I just appreciate you checking it out. MXPX.com. If you want to support what I do with this podcast, that's the best way to do it, whether by listening to MXPX, my band, or coming to see a show. Uh, by the way, thank you, everybody. Uh, Seattle, December 30th at the Showbox is sold out. Um, we kind of knew it was going to be. It's, uh, it's our annual um, end of the year Seattle show. So we try to do at least one. Sometimes we do multiples. But um, thank you um, for selling that show out. It, it, it's, it's awesome. And, and we're going to have a great time. We're kicking it off, kicking off like the Find A Way Home tour with this Seattle show. Yes, we've been doing uh, new songs along the way as we've been playing Furnace Fest uh, when we were young in Indonesia. But um, now we're going to kick it up a notch. We're going to play, we're going to play more new stuff. And uh, we're going to have the time because we're going to be doing headlining shows. And so we'll have, we'll have a longer set. All right, you guys. Uh, I didn't tell you about these shows. Every, all these shows are on sale right now, and then we'll get into, maybe I'll do a little recap on my last couple of weeks. We'll get into a couple of voicemails, and you'll be on your way, and I hope you have a great week. Um, so on sale right now, we have January 6th. That's 2024, kicking it off, our very first show of the new year, January 6th in Hollywood, California, um, at the Hollywood Palladium. MXPX, Less Than Jake, Reliant K, and Smoking Popes. Four amazing bands. I love all of the bands, including my own, obviously. But uh, come out. It's sold a ton of tickets so far. I would not wait. Tickets are getting lower. So don't wait on tickets if you want to come see that. MXPX.com for them for the link. Um, and then moving on, we're doing a bunch of shows. MXPX and the Ataris. So those shows are all on sale right now. Webster Hall is the first one of those, February 9th. That's my daughter's birthday, so I'm sacrificing a lot to be there. Uh, please come out and see us, buy tickets, come see me in New York. Uh, Webster Hall, New York City, New York. And I'm just kidding about, you You don't have to come see us just because uh, it's my daughter's birthday. Um, we're playing either way. It doesn't matter. I'm going to bring my daughter just for that fact. So I realized it sounded like I was guilt tripping you all for for making me play on my birthday, but I chose to, uh, not my birthday, uh, on my daughter's birthday, but I chose to do that because we just decided to just bring her along. Um, it's just the way scheduling worked out, so we're doing it. So New York, MXPX and the Ataris, February 9th. And then February 10th, on a Saturday night, Union Transfer in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Both those shows are on sale. Don't wait on that. Um, it's going to be, both, both shows are going to be off the hook. Um, and then uh, the next month, March, say February, okay, March 15th in Atlanta, Georgia at Buckhead Theater. MXPX and the Ataris, that's a Friday night. And then Saturday night at House of Blues Orlando in Florida, March 16th. Uh, tickets are on sale for both those shows. Go get them. I'll see you down south. Love you all down there. Um, we have a couple more shows coming up. Uh, April 5th, that's a Friday night. Ogden Theater, Denver, Colorado. That's MXPX and Five Iron Frenzy and the Ataris. So Five Iron Frenzy is supporting us uh, on that show. It's their hometown. You know, we've always played with Five Iron Frenzy a lot in their hometown. And I don't think they played last time we played. Maybe they did. I'm not sure. I don't think they did play last time we played Denver. But um, that's a Friday night. And then Saturday night, the Depot in Salt Lake City, um, that's April 6th, The Depot, MXPX, and the Ataris. All those are on sale right now at MXPX.com. All right. I know it took a minute, but thank you for letting me get that out. 
Um, shout out to Bob McKnight for uh, producing and, and helping out with the podcast. And if you guys aren't already part of the Facebook Mike Herrera podcast group, please go and be part of that because that's really that's where the center of the community is for the podcast. Um, aside from, of course, being a huge part of the MXPX community as well. But uh, if you want to be a, a more part of what we do here and hear what we talk about, uh, aside from just the podcast, go hit us up on the Facebook. And of course, we're on we're on all the socials, but the Facebook is the one where everybody seems to congregate and really talk. Um, all the other stuff like Instagram, I post the I post the, the, the I post the episode, but people don't really talk about it there. They talk about it on Facebook. Um, all right, let's get to let's get to my recap. I didn't really have this planned at all at all, but I I figure we just got back from a crazy trip, and I've been putting podcasts out that were recorded before I left for the trip. So here we are. Uh, we we did when we were young. Um, October 22 and 23, I think that was the dates. It was a, a Saturday and Sunday, and uh, I brought my family down to Vegas, and we we uh, we all got to experience that together, and it was cool because um, I don't normally bring my family to shows, but this was a show where you know they they could. My kids are 10 and 7, so. They haven't really gone to any shows. They went to one show. I brought them to De- The Descendants um, a few months ago, and they were blown away by that. More my daughter than than Rhodes. Rhodes, my son, he's a little young. He was he was into it, but he doesn't get as like impressed. <laughs> Everything's cool for a second, and then it's not. So um, it's uh, it, it's funny because getting him his. Getting those kids their first show to be the Descendants was not my plan, but once I realized that it was possible, I was like, "This is going to be awesome." Okay, we're going to bring the kids to the Descendants, and we brought them out, and they watched the Descendants play. We watched a little bit of uh, Jawbreaker, and they they enjoyed that too. But uh, they, they they really really loved seeing the Descendants and liked their songs and and liked you know seeing them play. But that was their first show, so this. When we were Young Fest was our was the second show for my family, and it was a week or no, it was like a month later. So it was uh, we go down there, and my kids go to bed fairly early. You know, by eight thirty, they're they're asleep or close to. Um, and so this was going to be some late nights. And the first day of when we were young, uh, they watched Goldfinger and enjoyed that. And we hung out backstage. They got to meet a bunch of people, a bunch of band people, a bunch of artists. And, um, you know, I, the, you know, they were just like taking it all in. And, you know, I got them some like free, free Adobe stuff and free other stuff. Like, <laughs> it's funny. Um, Adobe, because I used to be part of their, their uh, network um, as this podcast. Um, so, we're the, we're there. We do. I do my first show, and I'm doing two shows. I'm doing Goldfinger and MXPX. And Goldfinger's playing at like 3:20 on the same stage as MXPX is playing. So, um, MXPX is playing at like 5:05, you know, later in the day. So, we we're pretty happy with our time slots. You know, it was, it was so hot though. It was it was really really insanely hot. Um, but that's just part of the game. You know, you, you play these festivals during the day a lot of times and you're going to be baking in the sun. And so I did the first set, went great. I, was, I wasn't too tired for the second set. I think I did pretty well. Um, I was probably a little more fatigued from the actual sun beating down than, than doing two sets. But that definitely was like an eye-opener, like doing... I don't think I could have done a third set. Let me put it that way. I don't think I done, could have done a third set very well. And when when John got off stage, he was like, John Feldman, Goldfigure, he was like, oh, you know, he was dying. And I was like, I, th- I guess I feel pretty good, you know, and I'm not singing the whole time. But when you start singing lead vocals, that's when all of, all of your energy gets sapped. It, you know, your my endurance, my energy, anything that's in there, singing will take that away. Um 
and, and of course, the better in the the better shape you're in, the, the longer you can sing, and the more you can sing before that happens. But, but yeah, that that's definitely a real thing, and that was that was happening, you know, when I was playing with MXPX a little bit, um, and so for the next day, I just was a little bit more. I, I was just a little more more. I don't know what, what what the word would be. I was I was headed in my mind to to um, to be able to do certain things, but not do not con- like I, I I would say conserve my energy in a way, but not necessarily. Um, I, I wasn't not going hard, but I think I was picking my spots differently than I would if I was just doing this one set and I didn't have to come back and do MXPX. So. Um, I was still jumping around. I was still going crazy, but um, I didn't, you know, I, I I wore a cooler shirt. You know, it was, um, you know, John, John was wearing a suit out there, and that's really hot. And when I was wearing my vest for MXPX, that was pretty hot too. Um, not a lot of breathing going on with that denim vest. So, you know, those factors in th- those things factor into the to the show and. And the performance too a little bit, so everything kind of adds up. So, uh, but overall, yeah, I mean, it was really kind of fun to do both sets. I I enjoyed it. I hope people enjoyed seeing both. And then, you know, Rhodes is like my son. He's like, "Are we done now?" And I'm like, "Well, you know, we want to go see a couple bands. You know, we want to go see Less Than Jake. We want to go see, you know, some of our friends uh, say anything." And there was some, you know, bands playing that we wanted to see and I'm and then I'm like and I also have to go sing and we got to go see my friends in Simple Plan. So uh Simple Plan had asked me to come up with them and a couple other people and and sing I'm just a kid um the end of it and that's what I did. So I brought the family along, we got up on stage and and it's funny how you know if you're wondering like how do you get up on stage and stuff like with they were on a different stage than we were and sometimes on festivals you have your pass for your stage and you can't go on the other stages. And that was kind of a thing in some ways for this festival when we were young in Vegas, but it was, it was definitely that way when it got later and later into the night. So this was like seven o'clock or something. And maybe it was six, six up six forty five. I think simple plan went on. So it was, it was dark already, which is great. makes the show so much better when it's dark and I got, you know, they didn't want to let me up because I didn't have the right pass. And they didn't want to let me or or my family up, you know. And I had to, like, ask the band, like, hey, Pierre, hey, uh, they're not letting me up because I don't have the right pass here. And he's like, okay. And he had to, like, tell his crew. And, like, his crew's like, yeah, make sure that they get on. And and they have to tell the security people. So the security people that have been telling you you can't come up now have to tell you you can which is always a great feeling, but um, I don't rub it in people's faces because that's just part of their job. So it's just it's just part of the way things work. And and I knew that I was going to get up there. I'm like, well, uh, if they want me to sing, they're going to let me up. So it's going to be fine. And uh, sure enough, yeah, we got a nice little spot on the side of the stage and right there. And and I went up and sang with them. And you know, it's funny. You know, for for things like that, how do you prepare for for that? For me, um, I just listen to the song over and over i sing it in the car i sing it you know if you're not in the car or something like that wherever you are in your bedroom and you're you know if i'm en route to a show on a plane i'll put it on i'll sing it and i'll just make sure that i'm like singing the right parts lyrically it's all about lyrics all about like getting those lyrics right and the melody too but i think i knew the melody at that point so for me it was just about getting those lyrics right and it's different when you're like you've spent many years just kind of like mumbling the song like I know the song I've heard it a million times I've seen him play it a million times but I didn't really like really sang it like the actual words so it was like okay you have to like th- it's this way this time but then this way this time so like it changes up a little bit and so you can't just learn the one thing yeah it's very real um but it's just part of what I do you know I'm I'm, I'm gonna be um coming up in well by the time this comes out <laughs> i'll be done with it but uh i you know i'm going to be seeing my my friend's teenage bottle rocket this sunday because goldfinger's playing a show in orange county and they asked me to come up and sing on uh on without you which is a song that 
that I love. I love it. It's like one of my favorite songs they do. So, uh, you know, I got to learn those lyrics, you know, again. You know, I've, I've learned them in the past, and then I'll learn them again. So I just re, re-listen to it, sing along. I should be fine. And then I think that's just that's the, the way I do it. But if you really can't remember it, it helps to write it down and write it out. I don't go that far, but if I'm really having trouble with something, I will. I will go that far. Um, but, yeah, that's how I do it. So... Um, back to my recap. So that, that was day one and day two, like I was saying, I kind of, the, the family came out a little later. Um, and so that they had a little more, you know, gas in the tank and they got to spend the morning at the pool at the hotel. And, um, so that was great. It's like a win-win for everybody. And I got to, you know, go and do whatever I was doing. I was doing press, I was doing some photos and, um, and really, you know, just getting getting warmed up and getting ready for the show, and it's it's always um, it's always a, a big like who knows how this is going to go when it comes to the the ins and outs of the stu- of festivals because there's so many people coming in and out. There's there's you know are you, do we have a vehicle? Do we have a do we have to like take a Lyft or Uber over there? And you know it's usually a mix of the two. We usually do have a band rental vehicle of some kind um and then we'll have you know in any anybody that needs to go in at a separate time or whatever can just grab a car um or we'll have various crew people with their own cars there to, you know in vegas we had people there but um if we're on a fly out you know you're, you're pretty much you're at you're at your own planning mercies so you got to plan correctly for for each logistic and so depending on the city depending on what the situation is we we plan, but I like to have a rental. I like to have one vehicle when it comes to uh, festivals, when it comes to having a, sh- you know, just being at a show in general. That way, if somebody needs to get picked up at the airport, you can send their car, you know, send a car to go get them, get the crew. Um, that's just a very real thing. And, and a lot of festivals have traditionally had shuttle crews where they pick you up. And they have volunteers. And there's still tons of festivals that do that. A lot of the newer American festivals that are down down where we've been playing, like the Vegas one lately and the um, even Furnace Fest, they didn't, offer, they didn't offer transportation. It was just something that they just couldn't pull off. And so I think it's better if you, if you don't feel like you can pull it off and it is a big, big arm of a festival to have full transportation for your artists and crew. That's a big deal. Um, yeah, it's almost better not to even do it at all if you can't pull it off. And bands can just figure it out. And, and we do. We figure it out. It's a bigger expense always. Um, you got to spend money on transportation, rent, and lifts, and whatever all that is. But that's the world we're living in. Um, so, yeah, we, we, um, we went and saw Blink. We went and saw Green Day. Um, we, uh, we were in the VIP section. We were in the, the front of house section where the front of house is in, in between. They've got like, when I was watching, uh, Green Day, they, they had this, uh, drone, a drone pilot, like, and he had like goggles on. So, and then he had like a security guard to like make sure nobody messed with him, I guess. I don't know, probably, but, um, there was a security guard sort of close by, um, it's just kind of wild. Like it's such a big production that, that all, all these festivals have drone pilots. I'm sure, um, but uh, it's fun to watch. Fun to watch that stuff. Um, Green Day sounded awesome. Blink sounded decent. I mean, it's all tracks, so it's not you know it's not necessarily <laughs> it's not going to be bad. It's not going to sound bad necessarily, but it, it sounds very. It sounded very compressed. I don't know why it sounded so compressed. Um, compared to Green Day, but it was very different sounding. Um, I'm a fan of both bands. I, I like I like both bands. Um, the sound of the record, though, I'm not a huge fan of. Uh, I'll just put it that way. But I like you know some of the songs are decent and and man, I mean some some of their class. They have some classic songs throughout their career. Let's just put it that way. Um, damn it, starting with Damn it. I mean, amazing song. Love that song. Love Josie. Love all those old ones. But I love, you know, I like some of the new ones too. Um, I don't know. I, I like to reserve my 
judgment on actual new songs for a while because I know that it, it takes a little while to like find a place for a new song in your life. And, um, and so that's why I appreciate when people love our stuff right away. I, I'm probably a little different too, as an artist, you know, I think of things a little differently, but, but, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of, of songs by Blink and Green Day that I'm just like blown away by like, dang, that's a great song. Um, yeah, it's, it, that new Green Day song though, I'm going to go ahead and reserve my judgment because I haven't I haven't spent enough time with it, right? Um, it's easy enough to write a song that's, that's, that hooks you, that, like, is catchy, but is it catchy in a, in a way that you like? Is it catchy in a way that's not annoying to you? That's what I don't like, is, like, songs that are so catchy, but they're also not great songs, so you're just like, what's the point in having that in my head? You know, <laughs> I don't know. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, sometimes I hear, like, pop songs like that where I'm just like, oh. I don't want to. I don't want this in my head anymore. Um, but that happens to my own songs where I'm like, it's in my head. I don't. I. I don't not want this in my head because it's my own song. But I really don't want this in my head right now. Like I want to sleep. I want to sleep. Which brings me to um, the end of of uh, end of Vegas. We we left Vegas the next day. We had all morning because we couldn't get well. Let me put it this way. Let's go back to logistics. Let's talk flights. When we booked this tour, I didn't know my family was coming. I didn't know. Uh, sorry, when we booked this festival for Vegas, I didn't know anybody was bringing anybody. Yuri brought his son. Tom brought his girlfriend at the time. Uh, uh, Chris brought his wife. Who else brought some? That, that was about it, I think. Um so we all brought somebody, but it was, I think, once, we're, once we realized, oh, Tom's bringing his girlfriend? Okay, we're going to bring, yeah, I'm going to bring my family. So it's like, that's a good idea because this is a great show for everybody to see. And I think that's why everybody just brought their people, right? And so logistically, I would not have chosen the flight that we chose to fly back because we were flying back at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Why waste the whole, why, why hang out all day? I mean, there's not a lot you can do before a flight when you're a band. I mean, you could maybe go somewhere, but we have all this gear and we're going to have to check out of the hotel. You know, like, it's just not easy. So we got late checkouts. We left at the time to go straight to the airport. We did that. Um, and another reason why I wouldn't have booked this flight like that is because now we have to leave for Indonesia the next day, which we didn't know about when we booked these flights. So, we're literally getting back from Vegas on Monday night, 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock at night. And then we fly out at 10, basically 10.20 in the morning from Seattle. That means for us, we have to get up at 3, 4 in the morning and leave by like 6 in the morning. So uh, here we are in Vegas going like, man, I really wish I would have booked earlier flights. But you just kind of deal with it. And so we just dealt with it. The family was tired. I put them to bed, blah, blah, blah. All right, I'll see you next week. I, you know, I went and did my thing. Um, came back, slept for a few hours maybe, um, not much. And we're on our way to Indonesia Tuesday morning. And Tuesday turns into you lose a day. We got there Thursday. And had a show Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So we got there Wednesday night late. And we had we had all day Thursday. And then the show. So we're in Bali. Before we get to that, but Bali, I'll just tell you about the flight because you know, we're just coming off this weekend where uh, everybody's just been partying and having a great time working obviously too but like at the end of the night just watching green day and just in, you know expending the energy and here we are back on a flight to somewhere else and our flight from seattle to singapore was 15 hours it was 16 hours basically it was over 15 hours it was basically about 16 hours um and if you count, you know, you know, loading and unloading the, the, the airline, it was definitely 
the airplane. It was definitely over 16 hours. So that was a long run. And that was probably one of the longest runs we've ever done. We've done a, a London to, uh, I don't remember where, maybe Singapore, like something like that. We've done that, that in the past. And that was our longest flight before that. Um, I think we did a London to Israel, like a London to Tel Aviv or something that was insane. But, um, but here we are, 16 hour flight, we get to Singapore, we've got, I don't know, three, six, three to three hours or something. Maybe it was like even five to six hours layover until our flight to Bali. So we went Singapore to Bali and that was a, a five to six hour flight. So it was like going LA to New York or something like that. Um, so that was nothing. That was easy. Um, and here we are in Bali, beautiful place. It's, it's the most touristy of all the places we were out of Bali, Jakarta, uh, Makassar. Um, there's a lot of white people, but nobody's American. Like in all of the time they were, this guy was working at the hotel he was at, which was like eight years on this beach we were at. He said he had never met an American. All of the white people were, were, uh, or not that all Americans are white. I mean, but you know, you know what I mean, right? The non-Asian <laughs> people, uh, they were all Australian, European, German, uh, Russian, like all, all European types of people. But, um, so that was our, that's always fun, you know, being somewhere where you're, such a minority that and everybody was cool everybody's very very polite in indonesia across the board we get treated so nicely and and um the food was great so we sat on the beach that first day for a little bit um, everything was so inexpensive there you can really live like a king you can get massage for like an hour for like six dollars eight dollars maybe somewhere in there and food is is equally very inexpensive and very good the coffee, let me tell you, the coffee was amazing. We got breakfast delivered to our hotel, and apparently they didn't deliver mine because I didn't answer the door. Uh, I didn't wake up or I didn't hear them knocking, but uh, I had to call <laughs> call Brad, my tour manager, and like, dude, they never delivered. I don't know, man. I'm the only one. So they 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 probably had it set aside and they they brewed the coffee fresh. And I don't drink coffee. But I think I'm changing. I'm going to change again. I think I'm going to start drinking coffee again a little bit because this coffee was so good that I just had a little sip. All right, I'm not going to, it's not going to get me all buzzy or whatever, but like, why not? This is jet lag city. I just flew halfway around the world. Let's have a little coffee. And it was just so, so good. I, I, can't, I, don't, I can't describe tastes, but you know, when you have a good coffee, that's, that's what it was. It was just perfect. And it made me go, maybe I'm going to have some decaf now and again. Maybe I'll even have a little caffeinated coffee when the time is right. Who knows? We'll see. Anyway, that, that was uh, a great way to start the trip. And we, uh, we got to sort of acclimate ourselves to, to, you know, Bali and to Indonesia and to the time zone. Um, we didn't really get acclimated though, because we were never really sleeping at night. We were never sleeping full nights. More on that later. Um, on the beach, got to go, you know, just went in swimming. Yuri uh, rented a, a glass bottom boat, clear bottom boat, and took me on a little, a little voyage. <laughs> it was almost like we were dating because he's he was rowing me around, and I was just like filming everything. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. So that was like, yeah, it was like a little mini, mini vacation, uh, the calm before the storm. And we walked around a lot, you know, around the town. And a couple of the guys went and got some, got some drinks at a bar. And I, I went and tried to sleep. I couldn't sleep. Um, I, I laid in bed all night. And that ended up being a trend really throughout that whole tour. Um, you know, all things, I didn't really plan for, I didn't plan ahead. I didn't bring any sort of sleep aid, any, you know, maybe like CBD gummies or Benadryl or melatonin, any, th any of that. No, I didn't bring, and I don't normally use it, but I don't normally need it because I'm at home. But 
when I'm not at home, it's just a different situation. So I think now, huh, now I definitely need it. So, I mean, even Xanax, like I, I, I had never taken one before, but I got one and I was so exhausted by the time we really, we reached, um, Jakarta that I just, I had to go to the hotel and take a nap. And that's what I did. I took a Xanax, got, got a massage, took a nap, boom. I actually slept. I actually fell asleep. I was amazed and woke up feeling a little bit more refreshed, needed more sleep for sure. But that was the beginning of, okay, things are going to be fine. But backing up a little bit, the day, the day before the show in Bali was awesome. Like we had a great time. Everything went great. We met a bunch of people. We did press. We did some podcasting. Um, we were riding high because we had, you know, we had that, it was our first show, you know, you go on adrenaline, but like I said, like I didn't sleep the night before on that. And I didn't sleep that night either. I didn't sleep after the show. I was so exhausted after Bali. I was like, surely I'm going to sleep, get on the, get on the plane. You know, we had a couple hours uh, at the hotel before we had to leave to go to the airport, to go to the hotel or to, the fly to Jakarta. So Bali to Jakarta was like two and a half hours, two hours, maybe, maybe two hours. And we go straight from there to soundcheck. And instead of soundcheck, I went. That's when I went to go nap. And the guys just took care of the soundcheck for me. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you, crew. Um, and it made all the difference in the world. So here we are. I show up in Jakarta. Rock the show. It was awesome. Great crowd. Great show. Um, and here we are, exhausted again. This time we have an hour and a half to two hours in the hotel, have to get up, go to Makassar, straight to the venue before we get to the hotel, and it was rough. It was really rough, but we did it. You know, we went to a mall, we ate, we, you know, it's like we got the sound check done. Um, the crew did it without us mostly, and we just show, got to show up later and and got like, you know, a little rest time in the hotel. Again, I'm not falling asleep. I'm just like, every time I'm about to fall asleep, my body twitches awake to like wake me up. And it's some sort of like defense mechanism or some something, but man, it was rough. And, and so here we are, you know, just trying to do whatever I can to get some, get some, you know, so I, I go, I get a massage, I take a nap. I do pretty good. I don't know if I fall asleep, but ever since that first fall asleep in Jakarta, I'm able to get more rest, a little bit more rest, even if it's just like an hour. It's it's working better. So another Xanax, um, and here we are. So made the show happen, but I was so exhausted for the show in Makassar that um, – I'm surprised it was as good as it as it really was because it was a great show, and I jumped around and I sang great. And usually, I, I think that's why I felt so fatigued is because singing while you're fatigued is so hard. Like try jumping around, like doing like a hundred jumping jacks, and then sing your favorite song while doing it. It's going to be hard to sing, and that's kind of just what I was feeling. So, uh, I feel like I do a pretty good job hiding that. So you never really look at me and, and feel like I'm dying. I'm sure there are times where I actually do look like I'm dying, but <laughs> those are like we played some shows in Europe, you know, smaller clubs, packed, sweaty, just you, you, you feel like, oh, my gosh, this is what hot yoga is right here. So um, that show in Makassar was another feeling kind of like that. It was very dusty, very hot, so just humid. You're dripping, um, and you're you're doing the last one. So you're just digging as deep as you possibly can because after this, you can rest a little bit. And um, you might not be able to sleep for a while because there's a very early flight in the morning. So now you've got another couple hours to sleep and then just do it again. But you don't have to sing for a while. You don't have to perform for a few. So I think, you know, all those things run through your mind. But the, I probably am, am even talking too much about the actual like logistics and how unglamorous some of it is. Um, I mean, the hotel rooms are beautiful. The beds are very comfortable. Um, it's just that there's not a lot of time to, 
suspending them, you know, like there's not a lot of sleeping time and, and shout out to the crew again, because they slept even less than we did. And they're just as tired. They're doing, they're doing a job too. So it's not like they're not putting out, they're not jumping quite as much as we are, but you know, they're doing a lot. Um, so to be done with that show was such a huge, like, yes, we did it. We did it. Hugging each other. It's like, this was an amazing experience. And when you go through something that's hard to do, it's that much more memorable. It's that much better. It's that much more worth what you went through. So we feel like, you know, and in no way can we, can we uh, compare ourselves to like being in the army or being, you know, in a war or something like that. But like we were in our own little foxhole doing our own hard thing, whatever that is. Right. Like um, there's a lot of easy aspects to it. Sure. Sit on the plane for a while. That's easy. But it's also kind of just mentally hard, you know. But um, that's the easy part, right? Like the sitting on it, it's the not sleeping day after day after day. For me, that's that's really the hardest part about all of what I do um, as a musician. But at the same time, that's that's literally part of the job, and um, and I'm down for it. So uh, I just know that I'm going to do better at it next time because. I'm so bad at planning. I'm so bad at self-care that if somebody doesn't hand me something and I ain't getting it, uh, you know, it's it. That's it. You know, like, and there's some things. I mean, I can dress myself. I can take a shower. Um, but what, I guess like the extra things, the things that I didn't grow up getting, I still don't really think to, to, to look into. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that means. I guess, I guess I'm, I'm I feel like, like you're my therapist now people i don't have a therapist by the way but but if i did you people would be you'd be it i think all right that's the recap we get on the plane we head back to jakarta we have to uh, we have to get all our bags from this airline garuda international garuda indonesia um which is like american airlines something like that but over there and we're in Jakarta. We got plenty of time. We get all our bags. We go up. We have to wait until the proper time, and then we can check into our flight back home. We were going on Eva Air from Jakarta to Taipei, and then from Taipei to Taipei, Taiwan, to um, Seattle, Washington. So that was our flight path. We had a much easier situation as far as schedule wise because once we got to Jakarta, it was just waiting around. You know, we weren't rushing. We had plenty of time. Um, airport food in Jakarta not great. Um, I'm sure there's some spots, but I didn't see them. <laughs> I didn't have them. Um, but I did enjoy the airport food in Massacar. It's pretty good stuff over there. Um, Makassar, Makassar, yeah. Um, Anyway, I digress. Back to getting home. So we get on the plane. We go to Taipei. Kind of cool. That I've never been there. So we just were in the airport. But we got to. We had a beer, and just sat around for an hour or two, and then then got on our flight to Seattle. And so basically, it was like two ten-hour flights. It was a. Well, it was it was like a six or six or something flight and then in, then a 10 hour flight so it was split up and we didn't backtrack which is how we had like less flying time in general so all those things make a difference going the other way and so we left on monday monday afternoon or monday evening in, in fact and we got home monday evening so we left from jakarta monday evening got home in Seattle, Monday evening, about 7.30, 7.20, we flew in, landed. Um, didn't get home until, I don't know, 9 o'clock-ish. Um, yeah, probably around 9 o'clock our time, 9 p.m. And that was about 33 hours from hotel in Makassar to the studio in Bremerton, Washington. So thanks to everybody that came out to those shows in Indonesia. We had a blast. Thank you, thank you, thank you for buying tickets. I know uh, it was a big deal for you guys, uh, so we appreciate it. It was cool. It was cool. We'll we'll come back. We would love to. 
But um, we're now we're gonna we're gonna put our sights on the U.S. for a bit. And for those looking about at international stuff, wondering when we're gonna come to the U.K. or Europe or Australia or Canada or anything like that, we will. We will. Uh, we're still working on that stuff, and it's happening. But just be patient. So keep your ear to the ground, and we'll get back to you on that. Um, all right. Let's get to um, let's get to some voicemails. Hey, Mike. This is Matt from uh, Chesapeake, Virginia. Um, been a long, long time uh, listener of you guys. Uh, I think I first album I heard of you was '99, way back in '99. So, uh, yeah, wow, long time. <laughs> but uh, love all your guys' stuff. Every album uh, just keeps keeps getting better and better. And the new album is amazing. Uh, I think every song on it is a banger. <laughs> but um, had a couple questions, kind of like a maybe like a sort of like a two part question, but um. I'm someone of a musician myself, I guess, um, and was just curious, you know, I'm always interested in, like, the writing process of other musicians, especially ones that I look up to. Um, what is the song that you're most proud of writing, if you can pick one? I'm sure that's probably, like, a hard thing to pick, but, and then also, what's the first song that you ever wrote that you were like, wow, this is a really good song? I'm a like I'm a good songwriter, <laughs> but uh, anyways, yeah, love you guys. Uh, keep doing what you're doing, and um, oh yeah, one last thing. So the only time I've ever got to see you guys live was 2000 when you were on tour with Good Charlotte, and just thought that was kind of funny because I just heard that that's the tour where you met your your now wife. So thought that was kind of cool. But uh, anyways, yeah, love you guys, and. Um, Keep doing what you're doing. And uh, all right, thank you. Bye-bye. All right, thanks, Matt. That's a funny question. Um, I guess, what am I most proud of? Let me see. Um, there's always a couple. I mean, Stay Up All Night is definitely one from this record where I was like, wow, that's a good song. When I wrote it, I thought, that's a good song. And... The same goes for moments like this off the last album. And when I wrote that one, I was like, that's that's a good song. And I think it's because it's personal or something. But um, no, I think it's just a good song. But uh, Cautious Optimistic off the new record. I know some people don't agree, but like, I think that's a good song. Like, it's like, if you listen to it, you're like, okay, it goes, that's, okay, that, gro that grooves. Oh, I like what it's, you know, I I like how it's telling a story or whatever. Um, you, know, there, you know, there's a bunch of songs like that. The first time, the first time I wrote a song and thought, oh, you're a good songwriter. Hmm. That's a good question. That is a good question. Um, let me go back. Poking at you, anything off there? No. Teenage Politics, anything off of there? Certainly didn't think I was a great songwriter because of punk rock show. Um, mm, no. Let's see. Life in general. Doing time? Mm, no. Um, chick magnet? Certainly not. No. I don't think I thought I'm a songwriter at that point. Okay, um, let's move on. Let's go to let's go to Buffalo. Buffalo, what's on Buffalo? Under lock and key? No, that's kind of a train wreck. Um, even though I love the song, it's just like listen to it. It's, it's very fast, choppy. Can't understand what I'm saying. Um, still a good song. I didn't think that though. There, um, I'm okay. You're okay. I don't know if I thought that there either. I had to have thought it before this then, though. I had to have thought it, you know, between the first and second record or something, or...
you stumped me. What's the first? Let me keep going. Buffalo, then the ever passing moment. Okay. Unsaid. The chord changes. Whatever it does. I thought I was pretty clever with that and the, the lyrics. So maybe like the ever passing moment in general, in general, uh, the ever passing moment album might have been where I was like, okay, I'm starting to write good songs. I, I don't know if that's true, but misplaced memories. I thought that's a cool song when I wrote it. It's kind of a weird song. If you think about it, like I don't write orthodox songs. There's always something kind of weird about it, but not always. Secret Weapon doesn't really have anything weird about it. And I felt like when I wrote that song, I was like, that's that's a good song. Yeah, I mean, off the new record. It's kind of I mean. Not today. I thought that was a good song when I wrote it for sure. I was like. Now, I'm a good songwriter. Yeah. Yeah, that was, that was good. But, you know, but at the same time, you want songs that don't sound like they're trying too hard. You know, you I, I don't know if you want songs like that. But, like, I feel like my songwriting style is to let it come easy, to let it come, to to to, to let it come naturally. And that means not forcing things that don't fit with MXPX or this or that. And we, sure, we forced things in the past, and maybe we still do. I don't know. But I try to just be real and be true and, and to, like, be truthful with myself and have the idea. And if it's a good idea, it's going to continue coming. It's going to be fleshed out. If it's not a good idea, I feel like I ignore it or I forget about it or I just I don't spend the time with it. So, yeah. Wow. You know, this has been great. This has been great. I don't think we need another voicemail. We'll continue more voicemails next week. But honestly, this is this has not been a podcast I had planned on doing me talking the whole time about Indonesia and Vegas and all that. But I felt like it was kind of fun because you got to see a little bit of the flight and the schedule that we do um, where I would never talk about this on a normal interview. But since it's my podcast, you get the inside scoop. And I love hearing about and making me think about, do I think I'm a good songwriter? Because, like, yeah, I guess I think I'm a good songwriter, but but at the same time, it's so subjective. Some people think I'm a terrible songwriter. I just think it's amazing when I can finish a song. And... And I'm not just finishing a song to finish a song. You know, I do want to say something and I want to emote and get a reaction. All of those things are true. But it is it is something just to finish a song. It's not easy. And so Bob, Bob, uh, our, our friend, producer Bob, Bob McKnight, he writes songs. He'll write a song in one day, in one sitting, in one, you know, five minutes or something like that. And then he'll be hard on himself that he that it's not good enough. It's like, dude, you wrote that song in five minutes. Shut up. You know, it, it's like if you want something to be good, you have to spend time on it. Unless you're one of the very, very minuscule percentages of people that live in this world. Most people like us, we, we need to focus on something. And when you focus on that, I feel like it gets better and better. Now, there is there is that old adage that you can you can make it worse, you know, you can like overwrite, you can overfix it, overproduce it, whatever you want to call it when it comes to music. Uh, we call that polishing a turd. Um, you know, if it's not good in the first place and you keep trying to make it good, it's just going to get worse. Um, usually when something's good, you just, it's good and you can, you can leave it at that. So I try to leave it at that when I can. And, and I don't try to overthink whether or not I'm a good songwriter because, like I said, it's it's subjective. So this was a fun experiment where now and again I feel like this is a good song. I wrote a good song. But I don't f ever think of it as I am a good songwriter. Um, 
I think when people listen to the album, that tells me, hey, maybe you're a good songwriter. But also, it doesn't ma- doesn't mean you're a good songwriter if people are listening to your album. It means, you know, whatever. It means a lot of things, right? It means there's a hype train behind you. It means uh, people want they want to listen to you. But it doesn't always mean you're a good songwriter. Um, there's plenty of hit songs that are by people that aren't good songwriters. I'll tell you that. And we won't name names. I don't want to hurt the feelings, but it's true. All right, you guys, thank you so much for listening, tuning into the podcast. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to it. Hit that like button on Spotify or Apple Music or Google or Windows Music or whatever you're listening on, Amazon Music. What are you listening on? I'd love to know. But uh, tell me when you write about it in the uh, on the Facebook message group. That made no sense. On the uh, My Career Podcast Facebook group. There you go. All right. MXPX.com. Come out to a show. That really is the best way to to support what I do. Um, I won't be doing a podcast if my job is working at 7-Eleven. I'll tell you that. Uh, But when I continue to do this artist thing, which I'm planning on continuing to do, um, I'll continue to do this podcast. So I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thanks to Bob for producing. And uh, thanks to my guys, my crew, and the MHPX team and crew for holding it down, uh, making it all possible for you guys. Thank you. All right. Peace out. Peace out.